Hello, and welcome back to the History 2020 Lecture Series here at East Tennessee State University. In the lecture today, I want to talk to you about a grassroots movement and a political phenomenon that occurred in the late 19th century, known as the populist movement. Specifically in this lecture, we will look at economic problems that plagued the United States uh, farmers in the United States in the late 19th century. We'll also talk about how these issues led to collective action on the part of farmers with the rise of alliances. We will also discuss the rise of populism as a third party movement and its political goals. And then finally, we'll assess the reasons for the decline of the populist as a third party and consider the overall impact of the movement and, and, and how it affect the future reform movements that will uh, occur in the 20th century. So as the United States approached the end of the 19th century, it was clear that the nation had undergone a huge transformation. The nation was fundamentally different from what it had been in the beginning or at the beginning of the Civil War in 1860. Rapid industrialization, a way, arrival of waves of immigrants coupled with the growth and development of cities all contributed to this transformation. Yet with the rapid change came economic, social, and political problems. Disputes erupted over labor relations, currency, tariffs, patronage, and railroads. The weak governments of the Gilded Age showed little inclination or even any ability to address these issues. Farmers, particularly hard hit by the economic depression, became very frustrated by the unwillingness of Congress to meet their demands and to do anything to ease their plight. Therefore, uh, therefore discontented farmers focused on political efforts. Uh, like so many of their urban uh, counterparts working in the factories, farmers began to realize that social change required demonstrations of power. Yet unlike uh, labor unions, farmers faced a complex array of economic variables that affected their livelihood. In short, farmers dealt with just more than just management. They had to deal with bankers, railroad companies, the world commodities market. All these things affected the agricultural sector, as did the unpredictable forces of nature. Farmers had to face droughts, blizzards, insects, all these things could negatively impact the farmer. Farmers also faced obstacles in the sense that agricultural interests had changed after the Civil War and in some cases were conflicting with one another. Because of the diversity of interests within the agricultural sector, farm activists discovered that it was sometimes difficult to develop and maintain a cohesive political organization. Yet for all the difficulties, farmer activists pre persevered. While their overall efforts may have fallen a little short, they did produce some remarkable results. So let's take a closer look at the problems farmers faced in the late 19th century. Despite rapid industrialization and urbanization in the late 19th century, the United States remained overall an agrarian society. Nearly 64% of the population was living in a rural, were living in rural areas in 1890. Farmers in particular had been subjected to worsening economic and social conditions. The source of their problem was long-term decline in commodity prices, uh, essentially from 1870 to 1898. For instance, in 1874, corn was selling for roughly 41 cents a bushel, yet by 1897 the price had fallen to 30 cents a bushel. So a worldwide surplus had, had essentially driven prices down. The railroad and middlemen who handled the farmers' products became convenient targets. Farmers resented the high railroad rates they were subjected to, but they really had no other alternative forms of transportation. Individual farmers could not receive the rate, individual farmers could not receive the rebates that railroad that railroads commonly offered to industrial shippers. Also, farmers did not have much in the way of political influence in comparison to that that was uh, wielded by the, the railroad lobbyists. So farmers, as a result, found themselves with little bargaining power, either as buyers or as sellers. Also, high tariffs operated to the disadvantage of farmers as well. The purpose of the tariff was to protect American manufacturers against foreign competition. It prevented foreign manufacturers from flooding the American market with cheaper goods. American manufacturers, in turn, were allowed to raise the price of factory goods on which farmers depended. Farmers, however, had to sell their wheat, cotton, and other staples in foreign markets where competitors lowered prices. 
Also, tariffs worked against farmers because it made it more difficult for foreign buyers to get the currency necessary to purchase American crops. Debt was also a constant problem in the agricultural sector. After the Civil War, farmers grew ever more entangled in debt. Western farmers incurred mortgages to uh, cover the cost of land and machinery. Southern farmers were forced to pledge their forthcoming crops to a local merchant in exchange for food and supplies. As commodity prices dropped, the debt burden grew, and farmers found themselves trying to cultivate more wheat or cotton in order to raise the same amount of money. But by doing this, farmers furthered the vicious cycle of surpluses and price declines. Essentially, the more crops they grew in order to pay off their debts, the more they added to the surpluses, and the further the commodity prices dropped. For example, farmers made less money planting 24 million acres of cotton in 1894 than they did in planting 9 million, of it, 9 million acres in 1873. Currency deflation also contributed to the rising cost of, bar of borrowing money. Today, the total value of currency is based on the public confidence in the government's ability to redeem the, the value of the paper money. Yet, in the 19th century, paper money was considered worthless unless it was backed by something tangible and concrete, something like uh, precious metals in the form of gold or silver. Now, up until the 1870s, the government had coined both gold and silver dollars. And officially, gold was worth 16 times more than silver. At this ratio of 16 to 1, this meant that 16 ounces of silver was equal to 1 ounce of gold. Gold discoveries in the West had so increased the, the supply that silver producers preferred to sell silver on the open market rather than to the government because they could get a better rate than the 1 16th value offered by the government. So as a result, in 1873, Congress officially stopped coining silver and adopted a gold standard. Within just a few years, however, new silver mines in the West began to flood the market with silver and the price dropped on the open market. Debtors, such as farmers, who were suffering from a depressed economy in the 1870s, saw silver as a means of expanding the currency supply. Thus came a demand that the government began coining silver again. Creditors, however, disagreed. They favored a more stable, tightly controlled money supply backed by gold. Before long, though, some Americans concluded that a conspiracy of big bankers had been responsible for the demonetization of silver and referred to the law as the crime of 73. American farmers were acutely aware of the problems that they faced in the modern economy, and in the years after the Civil War, they sought ways to improve their plight. So now let's take a closer look at how farmers tried to address the problems they faced in the late 19th century. While late 19th century American farmers are often characterized as self-sufficient and independent, in reality, they had for several decades been trying to organize themselves. After the Civil War, the Department of Agriculture sent Oliver H. Kelly, a federal employee and a former Minnesota farmer, on a tour of the South. Kelly was appalled by the isolation and the dreariness of, of uh, rural life. So in 1867, he and other Department of Agriculture employees left the government and founded the National Grange of Patrons of Husbandry, or better known as the Grange. At first, the Grangers defined their purposes modestly. They wanted to bring farmers together to learn new scientific agricultural techniques to keep farming in, quote, what they called, in step with the music of the age. Also, they hoped to create a feeling of community to relieve the loneliness of rural life. The Grangers grew slowly over time, but after the Depression of 1873 caused major decline in farm prices, membership in the Grange began to grow rapidly. For instance, by 1874, Grange membership had grown to more than 1.5 million members. It had chapters in almost every state, but was the strongest in the South and in the Midwest. As membership grew, the Grange began to focus less on the social benefits of organization and more on, the economic uh, more on the economic possibilities. They attempted to organize marketing cooperatives to allow farmers to bypass the middlemen, those who managed the sales of farmers' crops and who also took a large cut of the profits for themselves. To that end, Grangers set up cooperative stores, grain elevators, warehouses, insurance companies, and farm equipment factories. So at the height of the movement, more than 400 cooperatives were in operation, 
some of them forged uh, beneficial relationships with existing businesses. For instance, the first mail order business, Montgomery Ward and Company, was founded in 1872, and it helped farmers escape from overpriced local stores. Eventually, however, most of the Grange enterprises failed, primarily due to inexperience and the strength of the opposition. The Grange also became indirectly involved in politics. Their chief political goal was state regulation of the rates charged by railroads and crop warehouses. Usually they operated through the existing usually they operated through the existing parties helping to elect state legislatures who pledged to support their program. Occasionally, however, they ran candidates under independent party labels. For instance, in 1875, the Grange supported the Greenback Party that favored expansion of the money supply by printing paper money unbacked by gold or silver. The Greenback Party polled over a million votes and elected 15 congressmen. However, by 1880, the party had declined and totally disappeared after 1884. By this time, the Grange as well was losing energy. Political inexperience combined with a temporary return of agricultural prosperity in the late 1870s led to the decline of membership, so much so that by the 1880s the Grange had about 100,000 members. Now, despite its decline, the Grange nonetheless made an impact on um, and another Despite its decline, the Grange nevertheless made an impact and a, another vehicle of agrarian protest began to emerge. As early as 1875, in parts of the South, farmers were already banding together and forming farmers alliances. By the 1880s, the Southern Alliance had more than four million members and similar organizations were forming in the Midwest. Where the Grange was principally a national organization that tended to attract large and more prosperous farmers, the Farmers Alliances were more of a grassroots organization. The alliances became very popular among many isolated, struggling families who saw them as a type of community, and they worked to form their own alliances. They also worked to form uh, local farmers' cooperatives, and they established stores, banks, and other facilities to help farmers to avoid what were, what were known as the, the furnishing merchants who kept so many of the farmers in debt. In an effort to promote uh, cooperation, Alliance lecturers traveled throughout the rural areas attacking the concentration of power against the agricultural sector. Bankers and creditors, Wall Street, railroads and industrialists were all placed with the blame uh, for the, the farmers' problems. Uh, some of these alliance lecturers argued that uh, these forces control both the markets and the political process. Now, from the very beginning, women were full voting members in most of the farmers' alliances. Many of them held offices and served as lecturers. One of the more uh, famous and more fiery uh, outspoken lecturer of the, um, the alliances, and she eventually worked for the populist, her name was Mary Lease. And uh, she's best known for her statement that farmers should, quote, raise less corn and more hail. She urged farmers to attain their goals with, quote, the ballot if possible, but if not, if not that way, then with the bayonet. Although farmers' alliances quickly became far more widespread than the Granges, they still suffered from similar problems. The cooperatives did not always work well, partly because the market forces operating, operating against them were too strong to overcome. Some of the cooperatives failed also due to, to mismanagement. Yet economic and political frustrations continued, and by the end of the 1880s, these factors helped to create a national political organization. So now let's turn our attention toward the creation of a national political party. 